All right, we are live. Is the audio and the video still coming through clearly? Just want to make sure. I had to step out for a few minutes right before class started. Good, awesome. Okay, um, before we begin, I know that there was a, a couple students that emailed me before class about some things. I, I did get your emails. Um, I will I will get to them probably right after class. I, I, I promise I didn't. I didn't forget. Um, okay, let's uh, let's get to uh, statics. We're actually running down to the wire in terms of the topics we have left to discuss in here. Uh, we really only have two left. We have shear and moment diagrams, which we're going to start today, uh, and then we have friction when we come back from break, and that's it for statics. So I mean, I, I really sort of hit. I mean, we have our exam review, we have the exam next week, and I mean, we're going to have our final. But in terms of topics. Don't have that many left, so um, yeah, it's it's been it's been uh, uh, you know been a heck of a ride. You all have done a fantastic, so I'm I'm really excited to see where we've gone in here. Um, let's talk about some housekeeping. So today we're going to talk about shear and moment diagrams. Friday we're going to talk about shear and moment diagrams. I'll go ahead and tell you. Initially, I wasn't going to have a homework six point four, but I started prepping how I wanted to cover shear and moment diagrams, and I'm splitting up the loads. We're going to do concentrated loads today and distributed loads tomorrow, and I really think it's worthwhile to have a, a, a practice on an extra practice or set, uh, you know some more practice on shear and moment diagrams. Fortunately, as you're going to see, shear and moment diagrams aren't very long problems, especially if the loads are, are pretty straightforward. And we're going to keep the loads pretty straightforward in this class. For you civil engineers in the room, you're going to have structural analysis with me next year. And I mean, we're really going to tackle trusses. We're really going to tackle uh, shear and moment diagrams in there. And so we're going to make it much more uh, uh, intricate and much more uh, involved. So I just want to make sure that you all have an understanding of the idea for, for moving in your other courses. And for you mechanicals in the class, you'll have extra experience as well in mechanics of deformable bodies and things like that. So this is a task you will, you will definitely um, become familiar with uh, throughout your uh, uh, your academic career. Let's get into it. Let's talk about shear and moment diagrams. Oh, I did forget something. Okay, so uh, we uh, got a contact from Toyota Manufacturing. Uh, Toyota is you know the manufacturing plant in the area, and I mentioned this in structures and in my uh, uh, capstone course. I'll mention it in here. Uh, they are looking for co-ops and interns that are interested in environmental engineering. Uh, and they, they uh, contacted us and said they really want to uh, accrue some uh, some student workers in environmental. And they're looking to fill the positions like really soon, like yesterday. Um, if anybody is interested, uh, do me a favor. Uh, hopefully you all have your resumes or have, have resumes prepped. If not, I would get those ready yesterday. But if anybody's interested, just email me your resume and I'll get it moved up the pipeline, but do it like soon because I know they're trying to fill that uh, these positions and fill them quick. So if you're interested, let me know like, as soon as possible. Okay, um, let's get into shear and moment diagrams. So what are shear and moment diagrams? So this is probably the first time that you've heard of this concept and I can guarantee you it will not be the last. Um, I say here that they're incredibly useful tools for civil engineers, but if I'm being honest, they're just useful tools for engineers. Any system uh, that you have an element that's being bent, a shear and moment diagram is going to be a, a valuable tool. You know, there are certain things that, that, that engineers are expected to be able to do when they, when they graduate. Um, you know, like the truss analysis is such a, a seminal uh, um, skill in, in, in engineering. Uh, when you get to fluids, being able to manipulate Bernoulli's equation is such a such a seminal skill in in, um, in uh, 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 civil engineering. Like I'm thinking of thermo and, and your cycles, like your Carnot cycles and things like that. Shear and moment diagrams is another one of those skills that that's just it, it's it's like it embodies engineering. I mean, it's it's almost like uh, when you know the, the word association game, you know. Um, like I say the word peanut and you think of the word butter. It's like engineer shear and moment diagrams. They're so, they're so uh, uh, seminal. What, what are shear and moment diagrams? Basically, in a nutshell, they are graphical plots. They're, they're like they're, they're, they're plots of the internal uh, 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 vertical forces and the internal moments inside uh, a beam. Um, they are critical to successful design. So uh, this is just an example, and, and I'll go ahead and tell you, this is a very 
funky example. This is this is hard. We're not going to do anything that hard uh, in this class. Um, but what this tells you is the change in your vertical forces and the change in your moment. So, uh, so for instance, some, some symbology I'm going to use. I'm going to use the letter M for moment, and I'm going to use the letter V for shear. I don't like to use S for shear because uh, for most people, as you're doing math, your S's and like I don't know if you're like me, but my S's and my fives look very similar. Um, and the reason why we use V for shear is because we're talking about vertical forces. So. Um, you know, if we have a beam like you see here, we're really talking about the change uh, in, in, in vertical uh, effects. What these tell you is, as the engineer, what you need to be designing for. So, for instance, if I'm looking at the shear, the, uh, a lot of times uh, as engineers, we care about the maximum magnitude of shear. So I would design this beam for a shear of 46 kips. That's the maximum shear that I see. Uh, I mean, I have you know, a 20, I have a negative 34. If I'm talking about um, uh, magnitudes, really the, the, the 46 is what matters. For moments, a lot of times with moments, we care not just about the magnitude, but about the direction. So I would be interested not only in the 460 foot kip moment, but I'd also be interested in that negative 100 because it's about whether or not the beam is bending in a positive direction or a negative direction. That doesn't matter a lot. In design, from a design perspective, it doesn't matter a whole lot with shear, but with moment, it, it tends to be a, a really big deal. Um, again, one of the most seminal skills that you can do, and once you understand the, the graphical tools and the graphical process, it's a, it's not hard. It's actually a very simple idea to understand once you've gone through the, uh, the process. Now, the first thing that we need to do before we, um, we begin is we need to talk about sign convention. Okay, so um, I'm going to stop the share here because I kind of want to walk you through some sign convention stuff here on the board. Okay, so let's take a member, all right? Let's sort of tie it to what we just did with trusses, and let's see if this makes sense. Okay, so here's a member, right? And I'm going to take this member, and I'm going to use my, my tool that we've been using a lot, this idea of cutting a section. I'm going to cut right through this member, okay? And now let's take the member, let's take it and let's split it apart. Let's split it into two separate pieces. So I'll put this piece here on the left over here. And I'll put this piece over here on the right over here. Okay. Now to tie it to what we did with trusses, uh, let me get back here in the camera. To tie it to what we did here with trusses, okay, let's um, think about this member in terms of tension or compression, okay? So for the sake of discussion, let's say we have a member here, and let's just consider the ends of the member as like the joints in your truss, right? So imagine that's the, that these ends of the member are joints in the truss. So if I wanted to define, let's say, tension, well, tension is always pulling away from the joint, right? So this would be tension, but this would also be tension, right? Remember, we draw the arrows uh, uh, in the opposite direction. So on one joint, we have the arrow pointing to the right, and on the other, we have the arrow pointing to the left. Internally, what we're talking about is two forces along the length of the member that are, that are essentially yanking on the member, and so they're applied in opposite directions. So this would be, if we were trying to define tension, this would be our, our, our the way that we do that. And if we're looking at it from a sign convention perspective, one of the things we'd have to ask is, well, what do we want to consider positive? Do we want to consider tension positive or do we want to consider compression positive? So if we wanted to consider tension positive, then this would be our positive indicators for our sign convention. If we were wanting to consider compression positive, then this would be our positive direction and this would be our positive direction. So this would be the sign convention for axial loads if we were considering compression positive, and the opposite would be true if we were considering tension positive. So which one's, which one's right? You know, is tension positive or compression positive? It's not really a matter of what's right or what's wrong. It's just a matter of what we accept when we do our computation. More often than not, in computations, we consider tension positive. Um, the idea, the way I've always thought about it is the reason that we consider tension positive is because if a member is in tension, it wants to increase in length. It wants to get longer. So that, that was the way I always thought, you know, 
That's why I consider tension positive. So axially, you could consider tension positive or you could consider compression positive, but normally we always consider tension positive. Again, equal and opposite direction. So uh, first off, is everybody with me so far? I don't want to rush through this. Any questions so far? Okay. All right. So this is axial loads. This, this lecture and this discussion is about shear and moments. Okay. So what's the sign convention for shears and moments? Well, um, but we have to sort of pick something. Okay. So let's talk about shears first. Okay. So if axial loads is talking about forces in the X direction, then shears are talking about forces in the Y direction. And remember, we have to draw the arrows so that they're you know, in the opposite direction. They can't both be up on one side. One, ha one side has to be up and one side has to be down. And so the question is, which one do we go? Or which one do we do? Which, which way do we go? And in engineering applications, what we define as positive shears, we always define this internal shear uh, to be positive going down, and this internal shear to be positive going up. Okay? And this is just sort of one of those things that you kind of have to memorize, that uh, when you cut a section, and you look to the left, downward shears is positive. When you cut a section and look to the right, upward shears are positive. And unlike with axial forces, where you can kind of choose which one you want, with shears and moments, you really kind of have to stick with a consistent sign convention because your sign convention is going to match the graphical approach that we're going to derive here in a bit. So with shears, this is our positive sign convention for shears for moments. What we do is we say moments on this side need to be counterclockwise and moments on this side need to be clockwise. OK, and and if this is a little fuzzy to you now, that's OK. When we start doing our problem here in a little bit, I think you'll kind of see, OK, I kind of get I kind of get what we're doing here. So, um, so let me go to, to, you know, back to the, the PowerPoint. So when you cut it and you you look internally you know think about a two-dimensional problem right a two-dimensional problem has some of forces in the X direction some of forces in the Y direction and some of moments so internally in a member you could have three unknown components you could have an unknown component uh, along the X direction along the axis of the member you could have a transverse component you could have a shear that's the V or you could have a moment so with trusses all we had were the axial loads or the P's that you see here on the slide. We didn't have any shears, we didn't have any moments. There was just axial loads. But with beams, you could have shears and moments. And so there's there's a lot going on here in terms of the internal forces. The idea is that the shear and moment diagrams that we're going to use here in a little bit make a lot of this math a whole lot easier for us as engineers. Because there's a lot going on inside the beam and we want a way of digesting it and understanding it in a very easy to comprehend uh, 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 concept. So what are we trying to do here? What's the what's the goal? OK, so let's say I have a beam and, and I've got here a beam with some like variable load on it. It doesn't really matter what what the loads are on uh, on. And let's say I'm trying to determine the internal shears, the internal moments uh, inside the beam. OK, so let's just pick a spot. Let's say I'm interested in this spot right Okay. Well, one of the ways that I could do this is I could cut a section. I could say, okay, I'm going to look either to the left or to the right. So I've got, you know, here's the beam. I have my, you know, support here. I've got this, you know, load right here, right here, right here. Here's, here's where I cut the section. And so I have a positive shear, positive moment. And then what I can do is use equations of equilibrium to figure out what those values are and that's great if you want to spot check and we're going to do that at the end of our example uh today but what if we wanted to look at it a little more holistically what if we want the shears and moments everywhere okay what that means is that we're basically graphing the shear and moment along the beam that's really what uh, shear and moment diagrams are they're just a graph it's just going back to um uh, to algebra when you learned how to uh, graph, you know, on an X, Y coordinate plane. That's basically what we're doing. We're just doing it graphically looking at the shears and moments. Now, the way that we do this, and I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you, is we we, uh, we end up looking at it a little bit infinitesimally. So we're going to have a little bit of calculus pop up here in a little bit. Um, but the calculus that you're going to see 
and I want to be clear, I, I don't want anybody to get scared. Oh, God, here comes the calculus. The calculus is there just to make sure that we understand the ideas. We're really not going to be taking a lot of derivatives and integrals or anything like that, but the concepts uh, really matter. Okay, so here's how I'm going to go about this, and, and what I'm going to be trying to do uh, is, is instead of cutting sections all over the place, I want to try and develop some rules that I can follow that will make the graphical construction very easy. So the way I'm going to do that, I'm going to take this beam, and I'm going to cut out a little, a little differential element that's like dx wide. So if you remember from calculus, whenever we say we have an element that's dx wide, we're talking about an element that's really, really thin, you know, super, super tiny thin. And so what I'm doing is I'm taking that element that's super, super thin, and I'm zooming in, and I'm looking at the inside of that element. Now, now you can see here, it looks like I've drawn that element to where it's like a few inches wide. But remember, we're talking about an element that's super, super tiny. So I've got this variable load on the top of the beam. But remember, if I look at that element, that element is so tiny that I can assume that that load is constant. Okay, Since this element is so small, I can just see see how I went from a, uh, a variable load here to a load here that's constant. Because the, the element's so tiny, I can say, oh, just over that region, uh, it's constant. Now, one of the things that you're going to see that, that might make this a little confusing uh, is what's going on with this. I've got a V here, but I've got a V plus DV over here, and I've got M here, but I've got an M plus DM over here. What's going on there? Well, the idea is that uh, on one side of the element, I've got some shears and moments, and on the other side of the element, I've got shears and moments plus some change. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to figure out how much the shear and moment is changing from one side of the element to the other. So that little DV and that DM is like that little change I'm trying to figure out. And now that I've got this element here, what I'm trying to do is let's just go back to statics. Let's just look at equations of equilibrium. So let's start off easy one. Let's start off with this. Let's start off with some of the forces in the y direction. So let me show you what I'm doing here. So I'm summing forces in the y direction. And we'll take all the upward forces to be positive. So what do I have? I've got V, that's going up. So you can see I've got that as positive. I've got the distributed load going up. That's positive, but it's not W. It's W times the width, right? So it's like a distributed load. Like if I had a beam that had two kips per foot and it was over five feet, load two, it's two times five, right? It's that, that, that distributed load. So it's W times width of that element. And so this is going up, this is going up, I've got that going down, and so I have that uh, is negative, so it's minus V plus DV going down. And all I'm doing from then is I'm just uh, taking, uh, taking out all the parentheses, canceling out all the like terms, and I get this uh, that you see right here. I get that DV uh, is WDX. And what I'm ultimately trying to derive is some general rules that we can follow. So what you'll find is that if you have the load and you integrate it, you get the shear diagram because you know how derivatives and integrals are just inverses of one another. So the derivative of the shear is the load or the integral of the load is the shear. Again, don't worry, we're not going to be doing any calculus. It's more about patterns and concepts, and, and you'll see uh, how that goes here in a bit. Now, for the moments, we do the same thing. We, uh, you know, we sum moments. I just summed moments from the right side of the element. It really doesn't matter what side you sum them from. Uh, but what you end up finding is uh, there's a part where you have a higher order term. Uh, let's let's go back to some basic arithmetic. Uh, remember, dx is a really tiny number. Well, what happens when you take a really tiny number and you square? You get a really tiny number. So uh, any so we call that a higher order term. Anytime you see like a dx squared, and so whenever we do these uh, uh, derivations, a lot of times we neglect the higher order terms because they really don't affect our our answers very much. Uh, and so we end up getting a similar relationship. So ultimately, what we can do is we can kind of um, summarize what's going on the relationship between our loads, our shears, and our moments. And so basically, that to get the shear diagram, we just integrate the load diagram. And to get the moment diagram, 
we integrate the shear diagram. But when we plot, you're going to find that the integrals and, and all that is really, really easy. If you go back to calculus, you'll remember that, I mean, like, why did we, why do you d derive integrals? Like, what, or what's the point of doing integration? The point of doing integration is to take the area under the curve. And what we're going to find is a lot of the curves that we're dealing with are really easy. So the, the, we don't really have to break out the integral. Like if you need, if you're trying to determine the area of a rectangle, you don't need an integral for that. Just determine the area of the rectangle. And so there's some really cool statics observations that you can make when you're plotting a shear and moment diagram. You'll see what, what's going on here. Um, but the, the, um, the, 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 probably the most important aspect to remember as we delve into this, and we'll, we'll really delve into it a bit more during the next lecture, is these relationships between derivatives and integrals. So, so like, for example, if I have a, a constant, like a function that's like f of x is 3, right, and I integrate that, I mean, what's the integral of 3? The integral of 3 is 3x three you know, plus some constant. But the idea is that if I take a constant and I integrate it, I get a line. And if I take a line and I integrate it, I get a quadratic function. And if I take a quadratic and I integrate it, and I get, I'll get a cubic function. So the idea, for, for example, if this is what your load diagram looks like, and this is what your shear diagram looks like. And if this is what your shear diagram looks like, this is what your moment diagram is going to look like. And that'll become really clear as we... Um, uh, as we we get into our uh, getting to our process, okay. Um, let me start. Let's just sort of. I, I think the best way of getting into um, into this is to start looking at arguably the most basic example. Uh, and your your homework uh, problem is really going to follow along with this, and that's looking at problems that are just dealing with concentrated loads. Um, and so we're going to begin to cultivate this approach by first assessing being subjected to concentrated loads. So your homework is just going to be concentrated loads. The example we do in class is going to be just concentrated loads. I don't want to rush into this. I really want there to be some, some understanding as, as to how this works. So to draw the shear and moment diagrams, what we do is we follow the concentrated effects to construct the shear diagram, and then we integrate the shear diagram to construct the moment diagram. And when I say integrate, I'm really just talking about area under the curve. And if this seems like, what are you doing? What is going on? The best way to really dig into this is to start with an example. So I want to look at this beam. If you go back to your notes, you'll see that we actually looked at this beam before. Uh, when we first started doing support reactions, this was actually our first example. We're going to do it again because I want to make sure that all of the, the values are fresh in everybody's head. But uh, you'll see as we go from this beam to constructing a shear and moment diagram, you'll, you'll kind of see how, how everything uh, ties in. And then after we finish the example, I want to go back to this sign convention perspective and see if we can use this sign convention to determine the internal uh, shears and moments at a particular point, and does that match what's going on uh, on the shear diagram? Uh, okay, let me um, tell you what. Let me stop the share. I'm going to bring the notebook up, and then we're just going to go through this problem start to finish. So let me share the application. Okay. Right. I'm going to give everybody a sec. While I'm setting this up, see if you all need to copy this down. Okay. All right. Um, let me get my hands ready. Okay. So we have a beam that has a, uh, a, a series of point loads on it. Uh, we have a supported A and a supported B. Now, a supported A, let's just, I mean, we're going to, Treat this like we have a lot of the problems that we've done in the past. Support A has a vertical reaction, which I'll call AY, and support B has a vertical reaction we'll call BY. Now, um, support A also has a horizontal reaction, but the sum of the forces in the X direction tells us that one's pretty easy. There's no forces applied horizontally, so AX is zero. Now, 
one of the things as you're copying this down, one of the things I'll sort of emphasize is that shear and moment uh, diagrams, particularly if you're talking about beams that, that, that go like this, I mean, this would be very similar to a beam that you would see in a building or a bridge or something like that. Really the stars of the show are the vertical forces and the moment. So, I mean, yeah, you need to do some of forces in the X direction uh, to make sure that you know how, how to compute those reactions in order to uh, 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 achieve equilibrium. But really the stars of the show are the sum of the forces in the Y direction uh, and the sum of the moments. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, go through the uh, reaction computation. I'm going to do that part maybe a little quickly because I do, uh, I'll, uh, we've done this problem before, but uh, I'll walk it through uh, with you. If anybody has any questions, uh, let me know. So uh, what I'll do to start out, I'll start out by summing moments. Uh, I'm going to sum moments at A, and uh, we'll take uh, moments in this direction as positive. So what do we got? Uh, so we have 20 kips. Let's make sure everybody's paying attention this uh, this afternoon. The 20 kips, is that going to generate positive bending moment around A or negative bending moment around A? Make sure everybody's paying attention this afternoon. There we go, negative. That's what I like to see. All right. And the moment arm. There we go, six feet. Okay, all right, what about the 30 kips? Does that generate positive or negative moment? There we go. And again, it's not negative because the force is pointing downward. It's negative because at point A, it is rotating in a clockwise fashion, and we take counterclockwise moments as positive. Now, what's my moment arm right here? What's that going to be? There we go, 15 feet. That's what I like to see. Okay. And so now I think I can go a little faster. So this is minus 18 feet. And the moment arm is 6 plus 9 is 15, plus 7 is 22. Uh, and then BY. BY is going to generate positive bending moment times 30 feet. Oh, that... Wow, 18 feet. It's eight, you're right. It's 18 kips. How'd I do that? I don't know. Okay. So 20 times 6 is 120 minus 30 times 15, 450. Okay. Mine, uh, 18 times 22 is. 396, okay, plus BY times 30 feet is zero, so I'm getting negative uh, 966 All right, add that over to the other side. And so we're getting BY equals a 32.2 kips, and that's positive. Let me, let me not squinch that. So positive 32.2 kips or 32.2 kips going upwards. And so hopefully that, that's clear. Again, we've done that before. I just you know, went through it kind of quickly. I'll give everybody a sec. Does anybody have any questions on that?
Maybe I can scroll a little bit so we can still see the beam, but there we go. Let's go ahead and see if we can sum forces in the y direction. And again, if, if I'm going too fast or if there's anything that's uh, uh, confusing or whatnot, let me know. I don't, I don't want to rush through this. We've got plenty of time. If I sum forces in the y direction, I'm going to have AY going up. I'm going to have BY going up. So now I'm just looking at the direction. So up is positive, down is negative. And so I've got 20 kips minus 30 kips minus 18 kips equals zero. So AY plus uh, BY is 32.2 uh, kips minus 20 and 30 is 50. 18 is 68 kips. And so I think you could figure this out. 68 minus 32.2. AY is positive 35.8. 38 or 35.8 kips up. Okay. Now. Um, while everybody's copying that down, I'll give everybody a sec uh, and see if anybody has any questions. This should be pretty straightforward, though. All right, is everybody, is, uh, I'll tell you what, I'll ask this. Does anybody still need a few minutes? All right, I'm going to go ahead and scroll down a little bit, but if you need time, let me know. Okay. All right, so... I didn't want to redraw the beam, so I'm being lazy here. So here's the beam, and let me go ahead and label the reactions here. So this one ended up being 35.8 kips, and this one ended up being 32.2 kips. Okay, so we've solved those reactions. We figured those out. Now let's let's draw our shear and moment diagrams. The first step, whenever you're drawing a shear, whenever you're trying to draw shear and moment diagrams, draw the shear diagram first. You always draw the, the shear one first, okay? So uh, let me show you how we're going to set this up. Okay, so the first thing that I do, and, and I have the benefit of uh, having a marker with different colors and whatnot. Uh, I'll show you how you can sort of correct that here in a bit. I'm going to draw a solid line. It sort of goes like this. Let me scroll down a little bit so I'm not squinching this any is that I typically draw a um, solid line that goes like this and this is going to be my base for the shear diagram so we'll say V this is going to be my shear diagram and the units for my shear diagram I'm just going to go ahead and say that this is in kips right over here I do that because I don't want to have to label every single value um, let me see if I can draw that a little straighter That's a little better. Okay. And so the idea is that it's as long as the beam and it's directly under it. Okay. Whenever you're drawing a shear diagram, the idea, the way of checking that you've done everything correctly is that you better start at zero and you better end at zero. And so let me show you what I mean by that. We're going to start over here at zero. Okay. Now, what is a shear diagram? A shear diagram is just a plot that shows how your vertical forces change as you move along the beam. Okay? So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be paying attention to the vertical loads that are on the beam. And if you want a simple way of thinking about it, I am just going to do what the beam is telling me to do. What do I mean by that? I'm starting at zero. 
Now, if I go from left to right, the first force that I see is a 35.8 kips and it's pointing upwards. So I'm here at zero. What I'm going to do is jump up 35.8. Okay? That's what I'm going to do. Now, I promise this next question isn't a trick question. How many vertical forces do you see in this region? Do you see any vertical forces in that region? Answer should be no, right? There you go. So from A to this next force, there are no vertical forces. So there is no change in vertical forces. So we go like this, no change. Now, what do I see right here? If I look at the beam, I see this, this 20 kip load going down. So let follow with me here. If I'm at 35.8 and I drop down 20, where am I at? There you go, 15.8. See, this isn't too bad. So now I keep on going, keep on going. And why am I going flat? Because from here to here, there's no load. Okay, so now I get to this point. I'm at 15.8. What do I see? I see a negative or I say a 30, and that 30 is pointing downward. So it's like a negative drop, right? So but follow along with me. If I'm at 15.8, I drop down 30. What does that put me at? Now, hold on, no. There you go. Negative 14.2. Exactly right. So there you go. Yeah, no, that's that's right. If it was negative 15, you'd be right. Yeah. So let me let me sort of write this like this. Negative 14.2. Right. So then we keep on going through the process. Okay. So what do I do here? Tell me what to do. Down 18. And so if I'm at negative 14.2 and I go down, what's that put me at? There you go. So I'm at negative 32.2. All right. Now, what do I do? I'm here, and what do you see? What's going to happen? I'm at negative 32.2, and then what do I see? I see a 32.2. It brings me back up to zero. See, this is a shear diagram. That right there, that's the shear diagram for this beam. Let me, let me sort of clean these labels up a little bit because I want to sort of stack them up like that. So that's 15.8. That's negative 14.2, that's negative 32.2, and this is 35.8. That's a shear diagram. Now, here, let, let's talk about this conceptually. We started at zero, and then we ended at zero. Why did that work? The reason it worked is because some of the forces in the y direction equals zero. You have to start at zero and end at zero. Remember, the, the reactions that we computed, the 35.8 kips and the 32.2 kips, they respect the equations of equilibrium. They apply with the fact that the sum of the forces in the y direction equals zero. So one of the ways that you can think about a shear diagram is a shear diagram and, and the moment diagram are checks on your reactions. If we got the wrong values for the reactions, we would probably find ourselves having a problem with the either the shear diagram or the moment diagram. 
In other words, we'd start at zero and we wouldn't end at zero. We'd end it somewhere else, you know? So they're a graphical check on, on what you're doing, right? Now, if you're drawing this with a pencil and you don't have multicolor like I do, sometimes what I do is I'll, I'll kind of like put little tick marks on the zero side, or on, on the baseline so it tells me okay this is zero so everything on the left has positive shear everything on the right uh, has negative shear and and again what we're talking about is a change in vertical force right so we're, you know if you could see me on the camera you can see i've got a beam and we're talking about shearing it kind of like you know if you were tearing a sheet of paper like how would you tear a sheet of paper you'd pull one side uh, uh, towards you and push one side away from you. And so this is the magnitude of those types of forces that the beam is experiencing. Does everybody, uh, does this make sense? Does this concept make sense about how to draw a shear diagram? Is everybody okay with this? Okay, cool. Now, we have the shear diagram. I think it stands to reason that the next thing that we would want is the moment diagram. Now, let me show you how we're going to do that. Okay, so we're going to plot the moment diagram, and it's going to be in foot kips. Now, let's talk about those relationships that we developed earlier. Okay, one of the things that we had derived earlier is that the derivative of moment is the shear. Now, a way that you can rearrange that, you know, you can take this and rearrange it and say that the moment is the integral of VDX. That's just rearranging it. But let's go back to basic calculus, okay? When I integrate something, what am I doing? I'm trying to find the area under the curve. These are rectangles, okay? They, they're not that difficult, okay? So we don't need to break out the calculus. We can just compute the areas. Let me walk you through this, okay? Look here at the shear diagram, okay? Let's take this rectangle, okay? That rectangle has a height. So here, if I, if I, that rectangle right here that rectangle has a height of 35.8 what is the width of that rectangle six so what's the area of that rectangle What's the area of the rectangle going to be? There we go. 214.8. There you go. So somebody help me out and do this one. What's the area of that rectangle going to be? One forty two. Point two. Let's let's check. Fifteen point eight times nine. Okay. Now we got two more here. Let's do these. Now I'm gonna. What I'm gonna do when I draw these out, I'm gonna take the areas to be negative because they're down. But the air. I mean, you're gonna compute it the same way. So negative. 99.4, and what about the fourth one? Negative 257.6. All right, you wanna see something wild? Watch this, somebody help me out with something. What is that? 
Boom. That's zero. You want to know why it's zero? Because the integral of the shear diagram is the moment diagram, and the sum of the moments must be zero. That is also a check on your reactions. Not only must your shear diagram start and end at zero, but the positive area has to equal the negative area. The sum of all your areas have to be zero. Pretty slick, isn't it? Now, this hasn't, um, this hasn't uh, uh, a, uh, um, this hasn't affected how, um, or, or we haven't drawn the moment diagram, but the moment diagram is actually really easy. So watch, watch this. I'm going to erase this and get it out of the way. Watch this. So how are we going to do this? We're going to start at zero. We are going to end at zero. We actually already figured that out with the areas. And so let me show you how this is going to work. From here to here, we're going to jump up to 14.8. So now what we're doing is we're looking at the areas. Okay. And so that first off, that's supposed to be a line. I don't know why it's so wavy. Let me see if I can make that a little better. Maybe that's a little better. Okay. And so if I'm at 214.8, and I jump up 142.2, what's that going to put me at? Three fifty seven. All right. What about this? If I'm at 357 and I drop down 99.4, what's that put me at? Two fifty seven point six. And then two fifty seven point six, we drop down two fifty seven point six. We're at zero. That's the moment diagram. And, and to be clear, my, my art is horrible, but these are all straight line segments. They're all linear. I've got one other question since we're running out of time, but I want to see if there's anybody that has any questions. All right, let's, now th this is really going to, um, this is really going to test your, your uh, 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 understanding of some things. This right here is a line. What's the slope of that line? I want to see if anybody can tell me what that is. And here's a hint, it's 35.8. That's exactly right. What's the slope of this line? No. Oh, I pointed to a different line. <laughs> you 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 anticipate, yeah. It's 32.2, but it's negative. Think about how you graph line, right? That line over there on the right has a negative slope, but where am I getting the value? I'm getting it from the shear diagram because the derivative of the moment diagram, which is the slope of the moment diagram, is the shear diagram. But here's the point. We didn't take any derivatives. Like I wasn't, you know, using the quotient rule or, or anything like that. We're just using the concepts, the ideas, right? And, and we can use the moment diagram and the shear diagrams to determine the shears and moments anywhere. But this gives you a very visual you know, a, a graphical uh, 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 you know, intuition into the beam. If I was designing this beam, I would design this beam to withstand a bending moment 
of 357 foot kips. That's the biggest moment that the beam experiences. I would design the beam to resist a shear probably of 35.8. That's the biggest shear that the beam experiences. It has a negative shear of 32.2. I know if it can handle that positive 35.8, it can handle anything else. Um, let me take a second, let this digest. Does anybody have any questions about this? Does this make sense? It's a shear moment diagrams are really not that hard, but they're such a such a valuable tool and such a valuable insight into the, uh, the 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 distribution of forces inside the beam. These are the internal shears and moments inside the beam. This is what we would design the beam for. When you all take me or you know for structural analysis, and if you all decide to take steel design or concrete design, we're going to use these things all the time in there. Any questions? How would a question be worded if we were? How would a question be worded if we were to use the slope for an answer? Are you talking about a test? I mean, I, I mean, I, I don't really know. I guess it would depend on the question. And I don't know that, I mean, I haven't written the test, I, I don't know. But the, let me say this, the, the tools that I'm talking about here are not about, I'm not trying to develop questions and, and tricks to trick you on the exam. What I'm talking about more are internal checks that you can perform to ensure that the problem that you're doing is correct. Like, here's an example. Okay, and, and, and don't take this to the back. But if I said, here's a beam, what's the maximum bending moment? The way that you can determine that maximum bending moment is to draw the shear and moment diagram. And so for this problem, the answer would be 357, right? But everything I'm talking about, about the starting and ending at zero, the positive areas equaling the negative areas, the slope of the moment diagram coming from the shear diagram, those are just gut checks and sanity checks that you can perform yourself while you're doing the problem. You know, does the the pro, does the answer make sense? Is the the answer coming out the way that it should? Are you starting and ending at zero? Does the slope make sense based on the shear diagram? It, it, I'm not trying to trick you. It's more about providing you the tools so that you can assess the problem. Does that make sense? Any other quick questions? Because I know we're running out of time. All right. On uh, Friday, what we're going to do is we're going to take this and we're going to ramp it up a little bit because we're going to put distributed loads on the beam. And so distributed loads on the beam are going to change what the shear diagram and the moment diagram look like because we're going to start to have some linear shear diagrams and some parabolic moment diagrams. Uh, but we're going to take it slowly. It's not that bad. And you'll see how that, uh, how that works out. Uh, that's all I have, everybody. I'm going to stop the recording. If anybody has any questions, uh, let me know. I will see you all on Friday. Y'all stay safe, stay healthy. We'll uh, we'll see you then. Ah, yep. Yeah, I figured you'd like that. <laughs>